Hey everyone, this is Brady, the Game Dev Artisan. In this video of Godot Fundamentals, we'll be implementing saving for our user preferences using a custom resource and the resource saver. With this, we'll be able to track our settings for the music and sound effects audio levels, control scheme, and our custom control mappings for our input map. For every video topic, we try and cover a blog post that covers every step that you would want to follow along with in written form. Links for this post are in the description down below. Godot allows users to script their own custom resources just like they do with objects. This allows us developers to benefit from the serialization of object properties just like the base resource classes do in Godot. A custom resource has all the benefits of an object, a ref counted, and a resource class. This has a ton of great benefits that you can read more about on the Godot official documentation page, which covers some of the great use cases. I've also written a quick tips article about this that you can read as well. As always, links are in the description down below. For our purposes, we'll be taking advantage of the ability of setting up our own custom resource class for our user preferences that will track properties for our music and sound effects audio levels, what control type we would like to use, and any custom control mappings that we're overriding for our default input map. To get started, we'll create a new folder to contain our custom resources. We'll just call this resources. And here we can add a new script. We'll call this user underscore references. Now this is going to inherit from a resource. We'll give this a class name of user preferences that extends the resource base class. This will be exporting all of our properties that we want to track. For our audio levels, we'll be using the export range keyword. And this will allow us to map the minimum, maximum, and step value of our variables. Here we'll set a default of one float. Repeat this process for our sound effects level. Next we'll add an export variable for our input type, which will default it to our input schemes from our game. Here we'll use the keyboard and mouse by default. Next, we'll set up a dictionary for our action events, which will take care of mapping for each action, the list of events. Here we'll map the dictionary's action equal to the event that that action is mapped to. We'll also wanna be creating a function to save our resource using the resource saver save function this will take our current resource as self and we'll pass in the string of user directory. This is our user's data directory. And we will call this file user underscore prefs.tres. Note that the .tres extension describes it as a text resource, whereas a .res is a binary resource. Godot will automatically map all of your text resources into binary resources when you compile for a build. Next, to allow us to use this resource throughout our code, we'll want to create a static accessor function that will either load an existing resource that is saved in our user's data folder, or create a new instance of our resource to be modified. Here we can try and load in from our user directory, the user underscore prefs .tres that we've saved in our save file and we'll set this as a user preferences class to ensure that if it doesn't exist, we'll just get null instead. Next, if it's not a resource, then we'll set our resource equal to a new instance of our user preferences. And lastly, we can return our resource. You may have noticed that I used class name and extends in a single line. I saw this in a few code examples in the official documentation, and it feels just like many other languages do, and may be my new go-to for styling. Remember, this is always a matter of personal preference. Now that we have our custom resource defined, next we'll want to implement the saving and loading of our properties from changes that occur within our game menu. We open up our game menu scene. Underneath our scene tree, we'll want to take our music slider, our sound effects slider, and our input type button, 
I want to go ahead and give those access as a unique name. Then within the script, we want to make sure that we bind a reference to local variables within the script. Then we'll want to add a class variable of users underscore prefs. We'll set this to type user preferences. Now by default, this will be null. So in our ready function, we'll ensure that we store a local reference to either an existing or new user preferences instance using that static loader create function that we created on our user preference resource. Now, when our game menu is ready, we should have an instance of a user preference, whether from our existing save or by creating an empty one using those defaults we defined previously. Now we can map the existing values that our user preferences have, assuming that we've loaded an existing user preference. We can set things like our sound effects and music slider to those default values. We'll take the value and we'll set that equal to the user preferences instance of that audio level value. We're gonna repeat this process for our music slider. Next for our input button, we'll set whether it has the selected value from our user preferences input type. Next, inside our slider value change functions, we'll add a few lines of code to be able to set the user preferences values and save that resource as well. We'll start with our music slider value. We'll check if our user preferences exist. And we're going to set the user preferences music audio level equal to the value that we've just changed. Once we do that, we'll go ahead and call our user preferences save function to ensure that we save those changes to disk. We go ahead and copy this, and save this exact chunk of code within our sound effects slider, but instead adjusting our sound effects audio level instead. Then for our input type button, We'll go ahead and map that within our input type button item selected function. Again, we're going to check whether or not our user preferences are defined. And then we'll take our user preferences, set the input type equal to the index of the item that we've selected from our dropdown. And once again, we'll call the user's preferences save function. Ensure that we persist that to disk. Now, lastly, to do a bit of prep work so that we can properly save our remapped actions, we'll need to add a signal to our remap button from when we set a new event for an action. Let's go ahead and open up our remap button script. We can go ahead and add a new signal called action remap. This is going to accept an action and an event. Then from within our unhandled input function, once we've set the button press to false, we can then emit our action remap signal passing along the action and corresponding event. So back in our game menu script, we can connect our new signal to the on action remap function that will be responsible for tracking the changes inside our user preferences resource and then saving it off. We can go ahead and create that function down here on action remap. This will accept the action string as well as the event input event. And here we're going to check whether or not we have our user preferences defined. For our user preferences, we'll set the action events of type action equal to the corresponding input event. And again, we're gonna go ahead and save off those action dictionary remaps. Now from within our create action remap items function, we just need to refactor so that after we've created our button, but before we add it to our settings grid container, we're going to check if our user preferences are defined. We're going to check whether or not the user preferences corresponding action events has an action that we're currently creating the button for. In the event that it has an action that's already defined within our dictionary, we want to get the event from our user preferences, action events, action. And we're going to update the input map by erasing the existing events and adding the event that we saved from our user preferences. Now, in all cases, we wanna take the button that we've created. We're gonna connect that action remap signal to our new function that we created called on underscore action underscore remap. 
This will ensure that for every remap button that we create within our settings is connected to this corresponding function so that we can save any of those actions that we remap within our settings menu. And if we run our game, we can hear that our background music is all the way up. We drag that slider all the way down and change our input types. Let's change this to gamepad. We'll also adjust the mapping for our keys. Use the non-physical versions. We'll go ahead and quit our game. Now, if we run it again, we can hear that our background music is no longer playing. Hit start game, open up our menu. We can see that our input type and our remappings were retained. Now we've created a custom resource for our user preferences and can now track the changes that we want to retain between game sessions. Each time our game is ran, it will reset the state of our sliders and input configurations. And this just demonstrates how simple Godot makes it for us to save state and serialize it to disk. There are many other use cases for custom resources and other methods of saving state, and this is just an introduction to the topic. As always, you can start a discussion to dig deeper into the topic on our Discord community and check out the project files on our GitHub's project page. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like and letting us know down in the comments below. And I hope you'll consider subscribing to stay informed of new content in the future. And as always, thanks for watching and happy coding.